Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Moss, and in this video, I'm going to introduce you to the Splunk Observability Cloud Terraform Provider. Okay, first I want to talk about what the Splunk Observability Cloud Terraform Provider is, and then I'll explain why you would want to use it. This Terraform Provider allows you to create resources inside of Splunk Observability Cloud using standard Terraform configuration. And if I expand the Resources dropdown, you can see all of the resources that you can create using this Terraform provider. And the other two ways that you can create resources on Splunk Observability Cloud that I can think of is through the UI itself or via the exposed API endpoints. These are both valid methods of creating and managing resources in Splunk Observability Cloud. If you want to programmatically manage resources, then you would have to write code to interface with the API. And one thing that's nice about the Terraform provider is that it's abstracting away the API interactions that are happening under the hood so that you can declaratively define the resources that you want created uh, in Splunk Observability Cloud. And the added benefit to that is you're still able to manage those resources as code. So that means you can track and control changes using version control tools like Git, and you can implement change management processes like pull requests and GitHub. And you're not getting these benefits if you're simply creating and managing resources from within the UI. When you're dealing with critical infrastructure and production environments, you want to make sure that the resources that are monitoring those environments have a consistent configuration and any changes to those resources uh, are easily tracked. So you don't want an admin necessarily uh, making changes freely in the UI without anyone uh, knowing about it. For instance, if an administrator made changes to the configuration of a detector in Splunk Observability Cloud and no one knew about that change, and then later on uh, you start hearing customer feedback about uh, bad performance of your application or something like that, uh, it could take a while to realize that there was a change made to a detector that maybe should have been uh, alerting and sending out notifications, but because there were changes that were not tracked to that detector, uh, no one knew about the problems that were occurring in your environment. So if you implement a standardized development workflow and treat these resources as code, then you can hopefully avoid a lot of these situations and you'd be able to track and review changes through things like pull requests and you would even be able to make it easier to roll back changes when needed. So in order to utilize this provider in your project, you could navigate up here to this dropdown and click Use Provider. And then you would want to add the required providers uh, block uh, to specify the source uh, of this particular Terraform provider uh, in your Terraform configuration. And once you've defined the required providers block, uh, you would then specify the actual provider and here you would pass in configuration options to the provider. Specifically, you would want the uh, URL uh, for Splunk Observability Cloud, as well as an access token. So if I scroll down here to the authentication section, uh, it specifies that you'll need an org token or a session token. In our case, I'm going to be using an org token. And if I keep scrolling, you can see an example where we are authenticating with the provider. And so here we're defining the uh, access token, which is referenced as a variable. And they're not defining the API URL here, but I am going to specify uh, the API URL and the realm. And in the arguments section, you can see what parameters are required. The only two parameters that you have to include are the auth token and the API URL. Even though it says it's an optional argument, you will need to specify the API URL if you're not using the US zero realm. In this video, I'm gonna show you how to create a very simple detector. So I'm gonna to navigate to the detector documentation page. Now, the first thing that I wanna do here is create a new organization access token. So I'm gonna to navigate to Splunk Observability Cloud. From here, I'll navigate to settings and then I'll select access tokens. I'm going to scroll down and select new token and I'm going to call it Moss Terraform token and it actually has the correct authorization scope already selected so I would want the uh, API token authorization scope with the power role in this case uh, which is a predefined role 
And this gives um, this token the ability to manage resources in Splunk Observability Cloud. I'm going to leave the token permissions with the default selection, and then I'll select Create. Now I already have a Terraform project somewhat drafted, so I'm going to copy the value of this token and paste it into my tfvars file. I'm going to select Show Token, and then I'll copy that token to my clipboard. And then I'll navigate to my Terraform project, and I have a terraform.tfvars file. As you can see, I've already pasted in an older token value, uh, but I'm going to paste in the new token value that I just created. And I'm going to save that file. So the variable name is signalfx auth token, and that variable is defined in the variables.tf file. The variable is defined with the sensitive attribute set to true, um, but it's probably not a good practice to include the API, uh, any API keys or sensitive data inside of the TFRs file. It's probably best to inject um, things like API keys as environment variables in the environment that you're executing this uh, Terraform configuration file in. Or if you have a secrets management solution like Vault, that would be another alternative. Now the other Terraform configuration that I have defined in this project is in main.tf. And this is almost exactly the same configuration that you saw uh, on the documentation homepage when you selected use provider. Uh, this is just the required providers block where we're specifying the source of this provider and then we're defining the uh, provider here along with the uh, auth token and API URL. And here I've specified my target uh, realm, which is US1. Now creating a resource like a detector from scratch in Terraform is a little tricky. So I would advise you to first create a detector and validate its configuration in the UI. Uh, do a simulation of alerts, uh, so you know how many events, alert events would be created. And once you've validated the configuration, then you can uh, take and kind of copy that configuration from the UI uh, and paste it as a definition in the Terraform configuration. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's navigate back to Splunk Observability Cloud. And I'll navigate back to the home page. I'm going to select Infrastructure. And then I'll select Kubernetes and then I'll select Kubernetes nodes. I'll filter this based on the cluster name, and this is the cluster that I want to create a detector for. So this Moss Terraform intro cluster only has one node uh, currently, this 5562A node. So from here, I'll select detectors and SLOs, and I'll select create detector, and then custom detector, and I'll call it high CPU utilization for Moss Terraform intro cluster. I'm going to adjust the time to be a little bit shorter. And for the signal, I'll use cpu.utilization. And then I'm going to add a filter based off of the Kubernetes cluster name. and I'll select Moss Terraform Intro Cluster. I'll proceed to the alert condition, and I'll use a simple static threshold. I'll say that we want to alert when we are above a 90% CPU utilization. I don't really want the trigger sensitivity to be immediate because that'll end up uh, causing a lot of noise. So I'm going to select duration and then we'll do uh, for the time being five minutes. And you can see up at the top here that it has an estimated alert count of zero over the past hour, which looks accurate when you look at the graph. Uh, looks like we're averaging somewhere around 10% CPU utilization. I'll select proceed to alert message. I'll leave the message as default here, and then I'll select uh, proceed to alert recipients. I won't add any recipients here. I'm just going to proceed to alert activation and then I'll activate the alert rule. I'll select save. 
So now that we've created this detector, there's a little trick that'll make it easier to define the detector uh, in the Terraform configuration file. If I navigate up here to detector actions, I'll expand that and I'll select show signal flow. So now I can just copy this signal flow program uh, into my Terraform configuration definition for a new detector. So I'll leave this here for now and navigate back to VS Code. And I won't type out the entire definition here. I already have a partial definition of the detector resource drafted. So I'm going to copy that from another file. So I'm going to copy this definition to my clipboard and then navigate back to the main.tf file and we'll paste that in. Okay, so let's break down some of the components of this resource. The first being the resource type, which is SignalFX uh, detector, and then we're naming it high CPU utilization. And of course, this is the resource name within Terraform, not the name that will show up in Splunk Observability Cloud. On line 18, we're actually defining the name that will be displayed in Splunk Observability Cloud for this detector. And on line 19, we're adding a description saying that this detects uh, CPU utilization over 90% for five minutes in MOS's uh, Kubernetes cluster. And then on line 20, we can add tags to detectors and filter uh, detectors based off of uh, tags. So in this case, I'm adding uh, a couple of tags, one of them being uh, the environment that this detector is meant for, right? So we could have uh, tags for uh, dev, uh, staging prod environments, for instance. Now on line 22, we're defining the program text statement, and it is a multi-line string. And this is where we're going to copy the uh, SignalFX program from the detector that we created in the UI uh, into this section here. So I'll navigate back to Observability Cloud, and I'm going to copy this program here and paste it into my Terraform configuration. I'm going to update the rule name to signal. Now we have the program text for the rule, but we actually need to define a rule block, which is what we do on line 27. Now, when defining a configuration for a detector in Terraform, you need to uh, specify the program text, but you also need to specify one or more rules to match what is detected from those programs. So within a rule definition, you have to specify the detect label, and it should match one of the labels uh, from a detect statement in the program. So there could be multiple detect statements, for instance, and then they publish a detect label. So in this case, the label would be uh, here, the high CPU utilization for my cluster. So if I copy that label here, then uh, when this detection meets the criteria, it will uh, match with this rule. I know the severity was different when I defined it in the UI, but I'll leave it as is. Before I apply this Terraform configuration, I'm going to navigate back to Observability Cloud, and I'm going to delete the detector that I just created. So I'll close out of the signal flow program. And then up here under detector actions, I'll select delete detector. And then I'll navigate to detectors. And under detectors, I'll just confirm that that uh, detector no longer exists. And it looks like it doesn't. So now I'll navigate back to VS Code and I'll do a Terraform plan and then a Terraform apply. And let's quickly review the output from this plan and verify that it's what we want. It does say that there's only one resource to add, so that sounds correct. And when I scroll up, you can see here that it's going to create the high CPU utilization detector. And it's automatically setting default values for some of the attributes that I didn't set uh, in the definition of the detector. So everything looks correct in the Terraform plan. I'll go ahead and execute the Terraform apply.
and I'll confirm with yes. And it very quickly generated the new detector and returned that detector's ID. Let's navigate back to Observability Cloud and verify the detector. I'll quickly refresh the page. And as you can see, the detector shows up in the search results. And if I click on the Signal Flow tab, you can see the Signal Flow program that was defined in our Terraform configuration file. And it does look like it matches. And similarly, if we take a look at the alert rules and open up uh, this rule that was uh, created with it, uh, you can see that the severity was set to uh, warning uh, as defined in the config as well. Although I didn't add it to my detectors configuration, if you take a look at the detector documentation and scroll down to their example, it's a little bit more complex and it actually creates multiple detectors based off of the length of this clusters variable. So if you scroll down, you can see they define this clusters variable, which includes the name of uh, a couple of clusters, and then it's creating um, two uh, detectors for each of those clusters. They've also defined multiple rules and multiple detect statements within their SignalFX program. And the last thing that I want to point out here is that they're defining uh, notifications as well in the type of notification and who should be notified. So in this case, they're using email, but if you scroll down on this page, you can see that uh, there's a lot of different uh, notification formats that you can use. Um, email is one, Jira is another, and then you can use like standardized uh, tools like PagerDuty uh, and even Slack or Splunk on call. Again, just to reiterate the benefits of using the Terraform provider, uh, if I wanted to delete this detector uh, that I just created, I can simply remove it from uh, this main.tf file. And then when I perform a Terraform plan, uh, that detector would be deleted from Observability Cloud. But I could also make updates to the detector's configuration uh, very easily. If I wanted to update some of the uh, parameters around the SignalFX program, for instance, maybe the threshold should be a little bit lower, let's say 85, uh, I could do that too. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, we'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks for watching.